in Thomas Farriner's Pudding Lane Bakery. It's now almost one o'clock in the morning on Sunday the 2nd of September. The street is narrow and dark, filled with a mixture of tall overhanging houses. And as it's the dead of night, the street is empty of people. Everything's quiet in Pudding Lane, apart from the occasional bark of a stray dog. The Farriners finally went to bed an hour ago. Their 23-year-old daughter, Hannah, was the last to go to sleep after getting a light for a candle. Later, the Farriners would insist that everything was absolutely normal when Hannah went downstairs at midnight and that the fire in their oven was definitely out. But they would say that, wouldn't they? We now believe the most likely cause of the great fire was a stray ember which ignited a pile of twigs stored in the bakehouse. Unnoticed, it started to take hold. Thomas Farriner's teenage son and apprentice, also called Thomas, woke up. He realised the ground floor was on fire and immediately woke up his family who was sleeping upstairs. Trapped by the smoke, their only escape route was to crawl out of an upstairs window and onto a neighbour's roof, raising the alarm at the tops of their voices. This corner of London sprang into life as people around Pudding Lane realised they were facing their most terrifying enemy, fire. The fire began to spread incredibly quickly and within minutes it had moved from the bakehouse to other parts of the building, with sparks even leaping towards the houses next door. But why would the fire go on to consume the buildings around Pudding Lane so rapidly? Jettying created more space inside a house without obstructing the street below. But it did mean that buildings were dangerously close together. In London, you'd have had a street at the bottom wide enough for a cart or a wagon, but at the top, you could probably shake hands with your neighbour. Really? You'd be that window. close yeah. at the top? Yeah. With the tops of the houses packed so tightly, the fire around Pudding Lane could easily jump from jetty to jetty, from roof to roof. In the 17th century, many of the city's walls were made using a technique called wattle and daub. These were panels of woven wood known as wattle, which were then filled with a mud mixture, the daub. But it was this method of construction that actually helped the houses around Pudding Lane to ignite. At the Exova fire testing lab in Warrington, flammability expert Beth Dean is helping me subject an ancient style wattle and door panel to extreme temperatures. You can see the wattle on the inside, the timber. You can also see little bits of, of straw in there as well. Surprisingly, despite temperatures in excess of 400 degrees centigrade, the wattle and door panel doesn't ignite. The mud is almost protected. Well, it is, it's protecting that wooden frame on the inside. So it's proving really hard to set it alight. This process is used to test the flammability of materials to modern British standards. And the wattle and daub seems to have passed. The best performance you can get on this test is a class one, and it's achieved a class one performance. It, I mean, there's hardly any damage at all. That's correct. So th by today's British standards, this would have kind of nominally passed. That's correct, yeah. It's wow. done really well. But if they were made of such fire-resistant material, why did so many of the houses around Pudding Lane burst into flames? The answer lies in the fact that many buildings in the poorer areas where the fire started were not brilliantly maintained. So by exposing the wooden wattle behind the door, All right, in it comes. we can test how flammable these run-down houses in the poorer areas would have been. So we can see there is some action already. It has, and it fire, has ignited, has it yeah. And you can see the difference. That is, that's less than a minute and it's caught fire. The houses around Pudding Lane were in a similar state of disrepair, making them all highly flammable. And it was only a matter of time before they were destroyed by the fire. There'd been fires in London before 1666, right? Yes, we tend to think of it as the first serious blaze, but actually there have been loads of big fires. If you'd said Great Fire of London a few months earlier, people would have thought you were talking about 1212 when there was a huge fire. And what were Londoners' reactions? 
At first, they don't seem to have been that bothered. We know that from the great commentator on the fire, Mr. Samuel ah, Pepys. Ah, Samuel Pepys. I love Samuel Pepys because he's always on about women he fancies, big dinners he's had, and the greatest account of the Great Fire of London. And what he says what he is that Jane, his maidservant, had woken him up about three o'clock in the morning, so about this time, and said there was a fire in the city and had a look out of the window, decided it wasn't too bad, went back to bed. Pepys, like many other Londoners, was probably thinking that all would be well. But they hadn't counted on how incompetent the man in charge of the city, Mayor Thomas Bloodworth, actually was. In the small hours, as the fire was just beginning to take hold, Bloodworth had one last chance to save London before the inferno became unstoppable. And he blew it. He could have pulled down private houses, created a fire break, but those houses belonged to rich merchants who'd put him in power, and he didn't want to be unpopular. It's always politics. And he said, didn't he, of the fire, a woman could piss it out? Yes, he did. Probably not true in this case. It's probably not true, and also a very bad decision, because it means he's remembered for that dodgy joke as opposed to putting out the Great Fire of London. Well done, Thomas Bloodworth. As dawn broke, London was in utter chaos. Most people had stopped trying to put out the fire and were now desperately scrambling to save themselves and their things. Forget community spirit, now it was every man, woman and child for themselves. The writer Samuel Pepys takes a boat along the Thames and he notices the fire seems to be carried on the wind. It's killing the pigeons that Londoners keep for food. Pepys writes in his diary, the poor pigeons, I perceive, were loath to leave their houses, but hovered about the windows and balconies till they burned their wings and fell down. We know that other writers commented on the same thing. Strong winds and the unusually hot, long, dry summer. But what none of them realised was that these conditions were creating the perfect opportunity for wildfire. Even with today's state-of-the-art equipment, a fire backed by a strong wind can be a nightmare scenario for any firefighter. This is the Fire Service College in Gloucestershire, and I'm here to discover why the strong winds in 1666 had such a devastating effect. With the help of fireman Justin Thorne, I've built stacks of wood and paper to mimic the conditions inside the buildings that help the fire take hold so quickly. Within seconds, we've created our very own micro-inferno. 452 degrees, so that's a normal fire. But on that first morning of the Great Fire in 1666, we know the winds really picked up and the fire turned from bad to worse, something we're going to replicate with this industrial strength fan. Whoa! That has happened so quickly! The fan on it, it's changed. It's almost a completely different fire now. That is unbelievable! The oxygen from the wind acts as fuel for the fire, and in just two seconds, the temperature has jumped more than 500 degrees. That's gone straight up. Right, so what are we looking at? We're looking at 1,000 degrees. That's 1,000 degrees. 1,000 degrees. That's happened up. almost instantaneously. Yes. Wind-driven wildfires like this are still an enormous challenge to firemen today. And it's terrifying to imagine what it must have been like in London 350 years ago. I'm quite shocked at what I've seen here today. The devastating effect that wind has on a fire, making it almost impossible to put out. But think back to 1666 and the wind that was blowing, similar to the wind we created here today. It more than doubled the temperature of the fire. And with the primitive equipment available, it made tackling the fire a losing battle. 